This video is a collection of some of the most terrible accidents that have occurred on Mount Everest so far. The stories we're about to tell include the horrific expedition of two British mountaineers, the tragic attempt to ski down Everest summit, the horrific Japanese expedition of 1970, and finally, the death of a NASA astronaut on the highest peak in the world. Let's begin. Peter Boardman was a pioneer in the mountaineering community with various achievements under his belt. He climbed Pettit Drew, north face direct of the Olan, in the north face of the Matterhorn. In the expedition for Matterhorn, he met Joe Tasker, his companion on various future climbs. In 1972, he and his team climbed five new peaks and five new routes on the Hindu Kush mountains. In 1972, Peter Boardman made his first ascent of the south face of Mount Dan Beard. In 1975, after summoning the southwest face of Everest, Boardman and his team came across Mick Burke during their descent, who died during his climb. Boardman also made the first ascent of Changa Bang's west wall with Joe Tasker. In the next few years, he completed the climb of Karsten's Pyramid's south face and Kanchenjunga's north ridge for the first time in history as well. As can be seen from the impressive feats, Boardman and Tasker love to walk the less trotted path and climb mountains using new routes. So naturally, when they had finished the first ascent of Kongur and a new proposition was made to summit Everest via the Northeast Ridge, they were ready to take on the challenge. At this point, the Northeast Ridge of Everest was yet unconquered. This was mainly because of the dreaded three pinnacles that one has to climb over when summiting Everest via this route. These three extremely steep rock formations are a nightmare to climb and are known to test the resolve of even the most experienced climbers. The three pinnacles are located in the death zone, making a rescue mission quite unlikely if things go wrong. But none of this was going to deter Boardman and Tasker from attempting the climb. The permission of the expedition was acquired easily after the Chinese government opened up the mountains for foreign expeditions. The team for the expedition consisted of big names such as Boardman, Tasker, Chris Bonington, Dick Renshaw, Charles Clark, and Adrian Gordon. On 6 March 1982, the whole team was assembled at the base camp, ready to take on the challenge. After conducting some acclimatization climbs, they started on their way toward Everest Summit via the Northeast Ridge. On 4 April, the expedition reached East Rongbuk Glacier where they set up the advanced base camp at a height of 6,200 meters. At first, the climb seemed to be going very well. Boardman and Tasker were able to make good progress and establish snow caves at 6,850 meters and 7,256 meters. Once they had reached the 7,850 meter mark, they established the third and highest snow cave. They were near the crux of the climb, the Three Pinnacles. These pinnacles were going to be the most difficult ordeal during the whole expedition. But despite that, Boardman and Tasker continued their journey. However, an unfortunate incident would slow down the expedition at this point. The team was attempting the first pinnacle high up in the death zone. The high altitude, combined with the extreme winds and lack of fixed ropes, was a great challenge they had to overcome. While climbing the first pinnacle, Renshaw, one of the expedition members, was busy fixing a rope to ascend. While doing this task, he experienced a minor stroke. Such a severe medical emergency would have definitely been fatal if Renshaw had continued the climb. He could not make it back to base camp without help either. Once the team had returned to advanced base camp, Renshaw returned home with Clark accompanying him as far back as Chengdu. He would suffer another stroke at base camp, further increasing the urgency of getting medical attention. Bonington, another team member of the expedition, also realized he could not attend the climb to the summit without supplemental oxygen. So, he switched to a support role to help Boardman and Tasker reach the summit instead. The final push to the summit was now only going to be done by Boardman and Tasker. They left the advanced base camp on 15th May. The duo was able to make great progress during this time and reach the second snow cave the team had established earlier. On May 16th, they reached the third snow cave Boardman and Tasker made a radio call to Bonington on the same day. This would be the last radio call the duo ever made. The following day, the two prearranged calls that the climbers were expected to make never arrived. But this was not worrying, as there would be several non-serious reasons why the calls were not made. 
Watching from afar, Gordon and Bonington did spot Boardman and Tasker continuing on their journey through the three pinnacles during the day. They made it past the first pinnacle successfully. At around 9 p.m., they were spotted at the foot of the second pinnacle going behind it. The next day, Gordon and Bonington went on their way to North Cole to support Boardman and Tasker on their way down from the summit. They expected to get great news about the duo climbers having made history by climbing Everest via the Northeast Ridge during their stay at North Cole. But no matter how hard they looked and how long they waited, Boardman and Tasker were nowhere to be seen. They awaited the return of the duo for four days in vain. Unfortunately, Boardman and Tasker would never be seen alive again. After waiting for four dreadful days, Gordon and Bonington descended so they could look at the Kanchenjunga's face for any clues to the whereabouts of the duo. But this would prove futile. No sign of them could be seen. Search efforts began immediately. The Karta Valley was searched thoroughly to see if either of the climbers or their tools could be found. But this search was unsuccessful as well. It was theorized that Boardman and Tasker had been in some kind of climbing accident or they had died from exhaustion, making their way past the second pinnacle. But nothing could be said conclusively as the bodies were not found as of yet. The families of the duo were informed of the tragedy soon afterward. A simple epitaph was chiseled into a large slate in the memory of Boardman and Tasker near the 1924 memorial. This would have been the last chapter in the tragic tale of the 1982 Everest disaster. However, there was still one thing left to do, finding the bodies of these lost climbers. The future expeditions for the Northeast Ridge of Everest in 1985, 1986, and 1987 all couldn't reach the point where Boardman and Tasker were last seen, so they had no chance of finding the bodies. This spoke volumes about the experience and commitment that the climbers had shown, getting so far ahead that, for years, no one could catch up. Finally, in 1988, an expedition consisting of Russell Bryce and Harry Taylor was able to make it through the three pinnacles. They summited Everest and made their way downward successfully. However, at no point could they spot the bodies of Boardman and Tasker due to the heavy snowfall covering the mountain brought on by the monsoon. Another expedition via the Northeast Ridge Route wouldn't be made until 1992. Although this expedition was unsuccessful in summoning Everest, they did cross the three pinnacles and, in the process, made a grim discovery. The team spotted a body just a bit beyond the second pinnacle in a sitting position. It was located in an especially difficult part of the pinnacles. It seemed the reduced snowfall had allowed the body to be uncovered this time around. The expedition members took pictures of the body for record and descended down. The pictures were sent to Bonington, who identified it to be Boardman from the clothing and features. In 1995, another expedition found a body on the same route, which was thought to be of Tasker. But later on, Bonington figured out that they had found the body of Boardman as well and had misidentified it as Tasker. This conclusion was based on the picture of the body in the written accounts of the climbers. Some of Tasker's equipment was found between the second and third pinnacle. However, his body has not been found to date. It seems likely that Tasker too died before he could cross the third pinnacle. Perhaps someday, a climber will come across the body of Tasker, a legend resting in the mountains, which he loved so much to climb and explore. Hilary Boardman, Boardman's wife, and Maria Coffey, Tasker's partner, both traveled to Everest to feel like they were in company of their loved ones once again. They found some closure from this, as Maria writes, Joe and Pete, I thought, watching us leave, it was a fine place to spend eternity. The death of Boardman and Tasker was a saddening experience for their team members as well. They were well loved by their companions and their dedication to the craft of mountaineering was unmatched. The death of these mountaineering legends also left a scar on the mountaineering community. Boardman and Tasker were pioneers who had made various first summits via new routes of mountains around the world. They paved the way for future climbers and were an inspiration for mountaineers around the world. The family and friends of Boardman and Tasker established the Boardman Tasker Prize for mountain literature in their honor. This prize is awarded to authors who make a significant contribution to the mountaineering literature. The prize has been awarded to various authors, including Kate Harris, Brian Hall, and Simon Maurer. A Peter Boardman climbing wall 
was also made in Stockport Grammar School in memory of Boardman in 2008. Another Peter Boardman climbing wall was made at the University of Nottingham, Ningbo, China in 2016 to celebrate his legacy as a mountaineer and a Nottingham alumni. Although Boardman and Tasker failed to reach the summit, they still made history by reaching the 8,200 meters point on Everest using the Northeast Ridge route. Their story is one of determination, commitment, bravery, and dedication to mountaineering. This is why their names are forever etched, not just into the history of Everest, but also into the history of mountaineering as a whole. The Himalayan mounds are stunning, rising tall and reaching for the sky with jagged peaks, daring everyone to be brave and come for an adventure. Every mountaineer hopes to one day scale Mount Everest, but little do we know in the high Himalayas. The air is thin and time feels slow. Every step one takes to the top becomes challenging and strenuous. While some climbers decide to return, others continue the adventure, making Everest history even more enjoyable. Among those who dared to conquer Everest's height was Thomas Olsen. His journey was loaded with excitement, fun, and twists. Thomas Olsen adored the rugged landscape of his homeland, Bora, Sweden. He would travel to exotic locations twice a year to test his limits. But despite feeling satisfied, his curiosity grew and he desired more. His determination fueled him to ignore the weather conditions and keep moving forward no matter how hard it was. His thirst for adventures began in his 20s, propelling him to ascend metaphorical and literal heights. Starting from 2002 to 2004, he climbed five mountains successfully. His dream was about to come true as he prepared for his next most awaited and adventurous trip to Mount Everest. In 2006, Thomas Olsen and a group of climbers gathered at Everest Base Camp on a frosty morning. He glared at the charming Everest. Its tall peak and stunning views mesmerized his eyes. I can do it, he repeated in his mind. Thomas was a fearless mountaineer and was considered a master of the treacherous slopes. He went through the most challenging journeys of his life, but this time it was different. Thomas had an athlete's body and covering hundreds of meters was nothing much more for him. He climbed the mountain in two days, from advanced base camp, which was 6,400 meters above sea level, to the summit, 8,848 meters. The Mallory route which he took generally takes climbers five days to accomplish. As the ascent began, the group battled freezing winds and bone-chilling cold. The slippery ice seemed to tease their efforts, but Thomas denied giving up to those heights. He gradually walked up to the mountain, fixing his eyes on an invisible price. The journey continued for days as the expedition forged ahead. Every step witnessed human resilience and strength. However, mysterious incidents began to occur that disrupted the team's progress. Equipment vanished and terrifying whispers were heard during heavy windstorms. As he climbed up, holding the snow picket and other heavy equipment in his backpack, he looked at the peak that looked blurry white due to a heavy windstorm. He was fascinated and unnerved by a strange phenomenon that hissed in his group. He wondered if these difficulties resulted from his tired thoughts or if the mountain itself was conspiring against him. Despite the anxiety lurking in the air, the group pressed on, adding excitement to the expedition. The journey towards the heights of Mount Everest was a war insistent against nature's most lethal forces. The air grew thin as Thomas climbed higher. He experienced shortness of breath and exhaustion. He felt a chill in his legs, which reduced his hiking speed. This was happening due to a lack of oxygen and exhaustion. He slipped on the icy slopes several times, which injured his knees. He wanted to take off his hiking shoes and look at his feet, but that was impossible at such a dangerous height. He looked above as he lay on the edgy snowy stone. The summit was still very far. Different questions began to emerge in his mind. Would I be able to make it? Can I beat the chill that is gradually overtaking my body? The trial of mental and emotional strength began. No matter how tired and sick Thomas was, he kept reminding himself not to stop as he was close to achieving his dream, but he was tired and all he could hear was the howling wind and the echoing crunch of his boots. He began to doubt his decision to embark on such a daring journey. Thomas wasn't scared of heights or the cold. He loved this mountain and dreamt of climbing up and kissing the highest peak. He looked down at the group members waiting for his signal. As he led them, Thomas peeked at the summit that was still way too far. He smiled, took a long breath, 
stood up, brushed snow off his trousers, and signaled the group members that he was ready to move forward. As he ascended further, challenges increased. Altitude sickness began to grow, a painful reminder of his physiology limitations. Nausea and dizziness were persistent that threatened to derail his development. Despite his misery, Thomas pressed on, his determination outweighing his pain. The wind intensity grew, and it was getting harder to check on other members as the gap increased. The group spread out due to heavy wind and snow, so communication with them became increasingly difficult. Everyone was on their own now, which was somehow pleasant for Thomas because this helped him in self-discovery and decision-making. But at times, he would wish other members were there when he was experiencing his sense of vulnerability. On May 16, 2006, the group reached the summit of Everest. They skied into the north face via the Norton Kular, a 55-degree steep mountain face approximately 3,000 meters high. With every step higher, the weather turned more unpredictable. A brutal snowstorm would transpire, reducing visibility to the point that they couldn't even see their arms. This was a last warning from nature to halt. Thomas felt sick as a cold seeped into his bones, draining his energy and numbing his senses. He stopped for a while and waited for the snowstorm to pass, but as soon as it reduced a bit, he shuffled forward and began to walk on. Other members tried to stop him because the snowstorm was still intense, but Thomas was determined to battle it. A few minutes of rest gave him the strength and energy to embrace the difficulties and not lose his opportunity. He held the anchor in his hand, began stepping on sharp-edged stones on his way, and thought about his ultimate goal, which was not too far now. His unwavering faith in the transforming potential of adversity drove his perseverance, helping him to overcome each challenge with infinite grit. Tension cracked in the air as a group approached the fabled height where they thought the artifact would be. Thomas was leading from the front, pushing all the worries away. He could see the striking but strange top covered in mist that resided thousands of stories in it. Finding a hidden cave embellished with ancient symbols took a little while. Thomas's heart began to race and eyes began to shine. He looked at other members in excitement with a sense of admiration. This was an experience beyond his wildest expectations. Thomas thought about mountaineers who wanted to reach the summit but failed due to weather conditions or lost their lives climbing up. He felt gratitude for all of them because the last few days of his journey were the worst ever and at times he was so exhausted that he may have given up, but his willpower led him to the world's highest peak. He climbed up a few more edgy stones, followed by the other team members, and grabbed the artifact, but something felt odd. He felt like the earth under his feet was moving. Was it only him that was feeling the tremor? He quickly looked back and signaled to the other team members to hold, and just then, the mountain began to roar. The earth shook, and a huge sound was heard. A giant snowball swept down, crushing everything in its way. As he fought for survival, the climber's world was reduced to a vortex of snow. The slaying wind was the only thing that could be heard. It took the battered and broken climbers a while to stand on their feet. The cave was buried under tons of snow and rubble. Thomas and the other members came out of the ruins. They were injured, but still could walk. Unfortunately, just as they were about to go off, and after only around 1,500 feet of skiing down the north face, one of Olsen's skis broke, adding tension to an already difficult task. They used tape to try to fix a ski, but failed. Thomas and other group members were forced to upsail due to a cliff that crossed a Kular. Thomas looked above at the snow anchor and felt something was wrong with it. But before he could alert and warn other members, the snow anchor collapsed and he plummeted around 2,500 meters. Olsen was leading the team up front. He risked his life to save other group members and died at only age 30 on the mountain that day. Thomas Olsen is buried on the steep slopes of Mount Everest. He was a daring man who proved that determination and courage could drive humankind to reach beyond earthly bonds. It was on March 6, 1970, that the Nepali Sherpas and the Japanese ski diver Yuichiro Miura decided to climb Mount Everest, but this was not the plot. The twist comes when Miura decides to climb down the Everest by skiing. Yup. Now this seems quite adventurous and dangerous at the same time, 
Because climbing down Everest is one thing that is already full of hurdles, and skiing down the Everest is totally another thing. So in February 1970, the team from Japan arrived in Kathmandu for the Mount Everest Ski Expedition. Earlier in the 1960s, Nepal put restrictions on climbers and skiers from climbing any mountains due to some serious dangers and losses. But in the late 60s, the restriction was over, and so the Mountaineer Society was overjoyed and resumed their journey to the mountains. And the same happened with the ski expedition team from Japan. The team included mountain climbers, a ski team, photographers, a film crew, and other people from the press. This journey was both a scientific trip and a nerve-wracking ski expedition. They had a lot of gear with them that they needed to get to the Everest Base Camp. And for that, around 800 porters walked for 185 miles for 22 days. Shipments weighing about 30 tons were divided into two parts, 15 tons for airborne transfer and the rest for porter caravan use. They landed at the Namke Bazaar, 3,440 meters, on March 4th, and two days later, on March 6, they arrived in Thayangboche, 3,867 meters. The team established their first base camp at Thayangboche to allow members to acclimate to the altitude. It was on March 6, 1970 that their trip finally started. They stayed at the base camp for weeks to get used to the air of Everest and to save themselves from possible problems that might occur. The Inja Glacier Group, the Mingbo Glacier Group, and the Kumba Glacier Group were the three divisions of the squad. It was up to the Kumbu Glacier Group to choose the location of our base camp. What these excited and passionate people didn't know was that there were a lot of hurdles coming their way. It was on the 23rd of March that the base camp was erected in the heart of the moraine, directly below the icefall, 5,350 meters. With the previous two scouting trips, five of them had already traveled to the icefall. It was on 4th April that the team was able to set up Camp 1 just above the icefall. Things were dangerous and riskier than ever, but they had no plan to put a stop to their goal. However, on 5th April, six Sherpas from the Japanese skiing expedition were killed by a massive glacier avalanche at 5,700 meters. That was not the end of it, as another accident occurred. On April 9th, at about 8 p.m., one of their icefall porters, Kayak Searing 36, was killed by Sirak Fall at 5,525 meters. Even with extreme caution, it was impossible to counteract the natural force that seemed to be so powerful in the icefall. Because of these mishaps, the team was not only given a rude awakening, but they were also forced to fall behind schedule. As if this wasn't enough, some other members of the expedition felt high altitude sickness. Miura, on the other hand, was also facing a few problems. But apart from that, he was happy to be almost there and live his dream of skiing from Mount Everest. He turned Everest to his little ski resort. Before starting his journey, he was practicing really hard. He did a lot of tests with and without a parachute and also rode the undiscovered slopes. He knew he was ready to live his dream real soon, but no one else was sure if the parachute would work at such a height. At one point, Miura thought of giving up as back-to-back -back incidents of his team members dying was really a setback for him. But he kept going because he couldn't leave just like that when he was so close to winning. And he didn't want to disrespect the mountaineering community by giving up. It wasn't the first time he was skiing from a mountain, as in 1966, he was the first person to ski down Mount Fuji. There was a lot of material that was still to be loaded. And so to carry out the load to at least 8,000 meters, the Mountaineers were divided into two teams. It was the Southwest Face Team and the Southeast Ridge Team. On April 16th, the Advanced Base Camp, Camp 2, was erected at a height of 6,450 meters. On April 17th, the Southwest Face Team constructed the Advanced Base Camp, FABC, at a height of 6,600 meters. Now the two teams began to work as per their plan, and as they were likely to summit in May, so they had to make their way out. It was on 18th April that Miura and the team established Camp 3 at the Lhotse face. The weather was comparatively better and they had a little trouble finding their way. However, because several of the team members and Sherpas were experiencing altitude sickness, the load carrying operation was probably going to be postponed. Around 2 p.m. on April 20th, Hirabayashi and Kanzaki fell down the Lhotse face 
when Hirabayashi was descending. Fortunately, they were shielded by a rock's edge and unhurt. However, this is only a preview of the catastrophe that was ahead. On 21st April, around 9 p.m., a call came from Dr. S. Sumiyoshi, who was staying at Camp 1 with a few more mountaineers. He gave the news that put everyone in extreme shock. He told them that Narita had died of an unexpected heart attack. He told them that he was having his meal and suddenly had a heart attack. It was so sudden that Dr. S. Sumiyoshi and the other mountaineers who were there couldn't do anything. The body was tenderly transported to the base camp on April 24th. It was burned in line with the local religious custom at Tukura. One day's march below base camp in the presence of 11 members before being presented to his father who was waiting in Kathmandu by their commander S. Matsukata. However, at higher levels, the team members struggled because just six of our active members remained after 12 others were called up to take Narita's body down. H. Tamura and four other members of the Southwest Face Crew concluded constructing ropes at Camp 3, 7,600 meters on April 28th. Things were getting so bad that members of the expedition decided to call it off for the Southwest Summit and decided to pull all their efforts into completing the Southeast Assault. It was on 6 May 1970 that Miura did a few wide turns on the slopes of the South Col. He became the first person to ski at 26,000 feet. Miura hiked to the start of the long run down the South Col and was all set to go at 11 a.m. after setting up the plan for filming and rescue. From his point of view, he was all set and had taken all the precautions, but things were going to be easy on him. The winds were really strong as they were giving Miura a hint to step back. So with a heavy heart, he planned to stop trying to ski Mount Everest that day. And if he didn't ski that day, it would clearly mean that he would have to wait for another week. But the wind stopped, and at around 1 p.m., he made his way down Everest. He suddenly fell down the rocky and rough blue ice of the coal and quickly opened his parachute. And it did open. Miura was relieved, but only for the time being. As he thought now he would land easily, there raised a lot of turbulence. The wind's direction was changing in seconds, and he was losing the strength to keep himself balanced and calm. As if the worst was meant to happen on this expedition, Miura's parachute failed to function properly, and he soon realized that he was not in charge of the parachute. He was blank and didn't know what to do next, or maybe he clearly knew what was going to happen next. His skis touched the rough ice, and he did everything to slow down but to no avail. He was coming down at full speed and nothing was working to get his hands on himself. And suddenly, his ski got stuck on a rock and he fell. He could feel the cold and harsh ice on his back as he fell down. At that moment, he knew that he wouldn't be able to get back to life. And this was it. But God had other plans for him. He was saved. Yes, he ditched death and came back to life. Miura's skis were held in place by safety straps that kept him from flying as they failed next to him until one broke off and bounced like a toothpick. He tried to hold on to the ice, but he couldn't stop himself from sliding down the most enormous crevice in the world. After flying over a boulder, he was thrown 33 feet into the air. Miraculously, a small patch of snow stopped him by 250 feet from the Berkshund. When he was giving the interview, he said that once he was lying down on the ice, he thought that he was over and was on another planet. But after a minute, he realized that it was a miracle and he was still alive. Whoa, that was really unexpectedly good. A documentary was made on his expedition in which he tells about everything that happened in the air. The documentary is named The Man Who Skied Down Everest. It came out in 1957 and also became the first sports movie to win the Academy Award for Best Documentary. Also wrote a book on his adventurous journey in 1978. This tragedy of almost losing his life didn't make Miura put a stop to his passion for skiing down every mountain on the planet Earth. His life is full of achievements and hard work. Born on October 17, 1926 in Ohio, Carl Gordon was raised outside of Cincinnati on a small dairy farm overlooking the Miami River. He lost his father at a very young age 
and so he and his younger brother looked after the farm. Among his interests were home computers, mathematics, and astronomy. He also loved racquetball, baseball, skin diving, and mountain climbing. Carl's life was full of success and ambitions. He achieved what he always dreamt of, but unfortunately, climbing Mount Everest successfully was not something he could attain. Despite that, he remained one of the most important personalities of his time. His work and contributions to astronomy have been unbelievable. From 1974 through 1978, Hanese worked for the NASA Facility Definition Team for Starlab. From 1978 to 1980, he was a chairman of the NASA Working Group for the Space Lab Wide Angle Telescope. He has been the head of the International Astronomical Union Working Group for Space Schmidt Surveys since 1979 and he was a major force behind the notion of conducting a thorough full-sky far ultraviolet survey with a one-meter all-reflecting Schmidt telescope. At age 58, he went on the first and only mission of his life to space. He was on board the Space Shuttle Challenge. With this, he became the oldest American astronomer to fly in space. He ran a robot arm, tested and managed the instrument pointing system, and carried out numerous scientific investigations. In 1986, he stopped working as an astronaut and became a senior scientist at the Space Sciences Branch. He investigated risks to the space station and trash in space. This was a time when he decided to pursue his long lost dream of becoming a mountaineer. He had a veil this time, making himself mentally and physically ready for all kinds of situations he might encounter while summoning mountains. He started with Mount Rainier. In 1991, he, along with an expedition team, summited Mount Rainier successfully in Washington. This increased his urge and longing to climb Mount Everest. He was in contact with many of the expedition teams by then and fully intending to climb Everest and complete his research. And then in 1993, he found a British expedition and started preparing for the climb with them. At the age of 66, climbing a mountain and that also Mount Everest was not a piece of cake. But Carl was bent on doing this and he had achieved everything in life, but not this. He was in high spirits, as shared by Mr. Carr, one of his colleagues. But this was an attempt that happened to be the first and last attempt to reach K2. This was the story of Carl Gordon Hanese, who intertwined his astronomy and mountaineer life and was the most inspiring person of his time. It was around 1993, September, when Carl Gordon Hanese was on leave from NASA. He decided to participate in the expedition, which was an invitation by the British team. Even though Carl was a scientist, his love for mountains could not be hindered. Carl Gordon Hanese had another lifelong dream, to conquer the world's highest peak, Mount Everest. He yearned for its unique perspective, the sense of triumph, and the challenge it posed. This dream to climb mountains nourished Carl's life from childhood. Sir Edmund Hillary, who was the first person in the world to climb Mount Everest, was his ideal. He looked up to him and knew that one day he would be doing the same. But this was not it. Climbing Mount Everest, the reason for joining his expedition was to show TEPC. Hanese intended to test a tissue equivalent proportional counter, TEPC, at three distinct altitudes. First at 17,000 feet, then at 19,000 feet, and at 21,000 feet. The TEPC would offer information on how people's bodies would react to radiation exposure, specifically how bodily tissues would function, which is critical for planning long-duration space missions. After collecting this data from the Everest peaks, he intended to deliver it to NASA and BVI. So Carl was going on this expedition for all these reasons. He traveled to Tibet in the mid of September to join his team and they planned to climb the north face of the Mount Everest. They started this expedition on October 4th, 1993. Now you might be thinking that it would have been a long expedition or it may have occurred that he almost reached the peak of Everest, but it never happened. While the expedition team was getting ready to begin their journey, Carl was slow but steady. He was not really in a good position to climb the highest peak of the world, but as he wanted to research and contribute to the NASA and astronaut society, he had to do it. Before this expedition, he worked hard on his health. Hanese trained extensively, preparing physically and mentally for the daunting task of climbing Everest. His dedication and tenacity were unparalleled, but little did he know that his dream would ultimately become a heartbreaking tragedy. Before starting the journey, Hanese adjusted to his surroundings, first in Kathmandu, Nepal, and subsequently at the expedition base camp in China. 
Haniz and three other High Adventure BVI members began the Summit Challenge on October 4, 1993. Hopes were high as the astronauts and the scientists, who were Carl's companions, were all hoping for Carl to bring something back from Everest. And if he would be successful in doing that, he would become the hero. The first day of the summit went pretty well, as all of them were in good condition. They covered more than 2,000 meters in one day. At night, they decided to rest by camping at some safe place. The next morning, they started their ascent again. The weather was beginning to grow cold and colder minute by minute. The climbers tried to keep them warm with a few minutes break from time to time. After a few feet of their walk, Carl started feeling unwell. He started showing signs of high altitude sickness. He was feeling nauseated and was under the impression of a bad headache. His lungs began to fill with blood plasma. Around this time, they were at 22,000 feet, just near the advanced base camp. He was unable to move ahead and he had no energy to move back to the base camp. They were stuck in between with the cold wind blowing harshly. The British research group did their best to help Carl with oxygen treatments, but to no avail. Then they moved him back to the base camp, as it would be impossible for him to move ahead now. So they reached the base camp on 5th October, and there they decided to let Carl rest. And if he feels better in a day or two, they would again start their journey to climbing Everest. But this couldn't happen, as Carl was sleeping in the base camp. He died. Yes, it was in his sleep that he took his last breath at around 1 a.m. He died just 12 days before his 67th birthday. The news of his death did not arrive at his home until four days later. The wife and the children were in extreme shock as this was a loss they could never recover. There could be several reasons for his death, but most of the doctors say that Carl died because of high altitude pulmonary edema, HAPE. He is now buried in the Chainsty Glacier, which is on the north side of Mount Everest. It was his last wish to be buried in the mountains, and he got it.